Okay, uh, Assalamu alaikum and a good uh, morning. So, we will continue with our lectures and uh, before doing so, uh, I, I've already uploaded the lecture 13 and lecture 14 on Putra Blas, so you can have a look. And then the other thing is uh, your assignment, I've already created a folder. I will share the link to the folder uh, later on. Uh, please submit your assignments before 5 p.m. Okay. And let me start the lecture now. So uh, before we move on to lecture 13, let me go back to the point where we had this uh, thing that I was a bit uh, confused where the factor of 1 over c coming in. So let me just mention uh, the following. So if you remember that your four vector for your called, uh, momentum is essentially given by p mu and then you have the relativistic factor gamma times mv. So in other words, uh, gamma m would be the relativistic mass. Your m over here will be the rest mass. And then this will be e, uh, maybe I should write in terms of mc squared first. mc squared over c. So mc squared essentially is your uh, gamma mc squared, e equals to gamma mc squared, okay, so in other words, the, the uh, factor gamma multiplied by m will give you the relativistic mass, okay, so when uh, your, uh, when you have a rest frame, then this will just becomes your rest mass, okay, so essentially over here, you're supposed just to have uh, gamma mv for your for your p or sorry for your pe here okay so what happens in that particular case is that your pe is really gamma mev okay so uh where does the 1 over c comes from is essentially we're trying to pull out a factor of, uh, let me just write it down so that, no, I mean, uh, so what one has, okay, let, let's work backwards, that will be easier. So what we have is essentially we have e, e, c, v over c, okay, so that is what been written down here so if you calculate what that is that is essentially gamma m c or c and then this would be uh, this would be just v over c okay so what's left over here is your c squared at the numerator will cancel out with the c squared at the denominator so one, what's left is essentially your gamma m v, okay, which is precisely what we need for this p. Okay, so it's just pulling out a factor of e or c out from from the the whole what you call the whole expression here. So that you know, this e or c is uh, coming from this fourth component over here. So you just plug that component, uh, plug that factor in, so uh, that will actually give you the right uh, call, uh, factor that multiplies v, uh, that multiplies v, which is, okay? So I hope that settles that. Let me uh, close this. So we move on to lecture 13, 
which we have already started yesterday. So uh, essentially, we look at this uh, uh, Maxwell equations. There are four uh, equations. Uh, two of them is called source-free, and the other two is called source equations. The source are referring to the source are referring to your charge density and your current density. So in the absence of the charge or current, then you will you know, it will have uh, essentially just zero on the uh, right hand side. So and then we also uh, did this uh, idea of the continuity equation, which uh, essentially uh, relate this uh, to conservation of charge. So you can use this uh, idea of Gauss theorem to actually show that in order for the QDT to be uh, zero, so there should be no flux coming in or out. Okay, but if there is a flux coming in or out, there's a possibility of this uh, rate of change of charge in this particular volume, uh, very much dependent on the 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 current density that, that sort of flows into the volume or flows out of the volume. Okay. So today let's move on. So today what we're going to uh, introduce is the idea of gauge potentials. Uh, just give me a minute for a moment. Sorry. Uh, so the idea of gauge potential is to uh, initially you can be thought of as a mathematical trick okay, so that you get you are able to write the solutions down for your uh, Maxwell equation okay so one of the things that we have over here for example the divergence of B equals zero okay and you know that if you take the divergence of a curl, divergence of a curl of something, okay, it's always equal to zero. Okay, so we introduce this idea of, uh, uh, and it has to be uh, of vector, that something will have to be a vector quantity. So uh, one could actually try to do that uh, in this particular case by introducing a, a potential called a vector potential in, in classical electrodynamics. And uh, one, once, one we once we introduce this uh, vector potential, then this particular equation is going to be uh, automatically satisfied. So. Uh, that's the essential idea of introducing this potential in a way to get solutions of your Maxwell equations. Uh, the other uh, source-free equation, the other source-free equation is given by this uh, equation of a curl of E plus uh, a time derivative of your magnetic field. Okay, One could now introduce the curl of this vector potential in B over here, okay, and uh, once you do that, one could actually uh, uh, the vector operation of your curl del cross, okay, will be also here and also here. So in other words, we can actually uh, factor out the curl operation. So you 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 have this uh, uh, the thing in the bracket to be e plus one over c d a d t, okay, and a curl uh, one could again uh, use something uh, similar to this. So what one can have is to have something 
another something okay over here that can be equals to zero okay a curl of a gradient is always equal to zero so in other words one could introduce another uh, and and this curl of something this something is now different from the one above okay this will be have will have to be a scalar okay so when you take the gradient of a scalar uh, then you get uh, uh, essentially a vector quantity and that curl over that vector quantity is going to be equal to zero. Okay? So in, in this particular case, we will introduce this idea of a scalar potential. Okay? And uh, for you know, convention purposes, we, we introduce this minus sign as well. So in the end, what one has is that your thing in this bracket will be given as a as a gradient of the scalar potential and uh, remember that uh, if the thing that one really needs is a solution for your E and B okay so the B is uh, uh, the gradient of sorry uh, the divergence of B is automatically satisfied with this uh, uh, form of vector potential here uh, the curl of a wet potential. So in this particular case, we have another potential to describe your E together with your vector potential. So E can now be written as minus the gradient of the scalar potential plus the time uh, derivative of your wet potential. Okay, so you introduce this scalar potential and your wet potential to uh, eventually give you an expression for E and your B. Now, the only, uh, it's not, well, I mean, it's one complication that arises from this uh, idea of potential. The idea of potential is not something unique. Okay, you can always get different potential to correspond to the same uh, electric field and magnetic field okay so how can one see this is the following for example the case of a vector potential okay one can always uh, uh, introduce the gradient of another scalar here okay given by psi and write your uh, re you replace your original vector potential uh, with this uh, addition of a gradient of a, of this psi, okay, the gradient of psi. And what happens with this new potential is that when you take uh, the curl of that, so you get the curl of A dash, for example, and that, since you use a different uh, potential, you expect that this uh, magnetic field will be a different magnetic field. But it actually corresponds to uh, the same magnetic field because when you do the curl of A dash, okay, your A dash over here, you do the curl of A plus you do the curl of this gradient of psi. Okay? But the curl of the gradient, as we have seen earlier, is going to be equal to zero. So in other words, uh, this replacement, okay, is actually uh, giving you the same magnetic field. Okay. Now uh, that sort of okay. Uh, so in other words, your magnetic field uh, and the vector potential is only determined up to this uh, addition of this uh, we call gradient or another function. Now, the same thing happens for the case of your uh, electric field. If, uh, remember the electric field, the extra thing that we have is essentially the scalar potential. And if you set the scalar potential to uh, simultaneously uh, uh, transform by this time derivative of psi, the same psi as the one before, okay? then uh, 
you plug this uh, scalar potential into into the formula above okay together with this uh, transformation for your vector potential over here what happens in this particular case is that the addition of this will uh, somehow cancel off uh, the uh, yeah we will we'll cancel off uh, okay the simultaneous changes that you introduce in a and phi will cancel off each other okay so that's the idea so in other words you have to introduce this change together with this change okay and it will re reproduce uh, the fact that uh, this transform potential will produce reproduce the same uh, magnetic field and the same electric field so in other words uh, there's a uh, what you call arbitrary choice of potential to be put in uh, uh, the only restriction is actually the form of what this addition of of this psi is supposed to be so in the in the case of wet potential is in terms of the gradient in terms of the scalar potential is uh, given in terms of the time derivative okay so that's the only restriction but other otherwise your psi can be an arbitrary function so in a way this is a, an unpleasant uh, feature of interest in introducing the potential and because of this some uh, sometimes people thought that uh, your potential is not the real thing the real thing is essentially is your electric field and magnetic field okay uh, that idea perhaps holds in some sense uh, in the classical picture but it gets more complicated when you uh, when you introduce quantum theory into the uh, into the no this uh, gauge concepts okay, but uh, that that I will have to tell the story at some different course okay but the idea now essentially uh, you can use this potential to to solve at least at the moment to solve the uh, Salisbury equations. And this transformation that you introduce, this two uh, transformation, is called a gauge transformation. And it involves two potentials, uh, uh, a vector potential. Sorry, uh, that's the scalar. Uh, the vector potential and the scalar potential. Collectively, they are sometimes called the gauge potential. Okay. So, uh, okay, maybe I should not uh, what you call uh, ponder too much on this matter because uh, there are some interesting things happening with this idea of gauge potential anyway okay so let's uh, we have just done uh, how it solves the the Salisbury equations okay so we need to look at what actually happens when you introduce gauge potentials into uh, the source equations okay so the source equation that we had earlier is essentially this two One is for the divergence of your electric field, okay, and that would depend on your charge density. And the other is essentially the curl of your magnetic field with the time derivative of uh, electric field that will give you the current density. Okay. Uh, I hope you have a physical, sorry, have a physical feeling of what. Uh, how these things actually work uh, uh, 
in the ordinary sense of electromagnetism that you have uh, uh, done. You have done electromagnetism, right? For your courses. Someone? Have you done Good. So it's, an, uh, it's one of those uh, mathematical courses that you need a lot of uh, what you call vector calculus. So, uh, going back to this, okay, so how these uh, potentials will actually uh, you know, render your, your source, source equations uh, in, in some way, okay? So, let, let's look at it. So, we just simply plug in the, the, the formula for your E, for example, earlier was that. Okay, this is your electric field. So let's plug that thing in so you get an equation that replaces your electric field here involving your uh, scalar potential here, which is, is now given in terms of a, a Laplacian operator. So the Laplacian operator is just your L squared. So this is sometimes called Laplacian operator. And then uh, there's a part of it, remember that this is actually a divergence. Okay, so the divergence of a uh, gradient gives you the uh, Laplacian earlier. And then you have the divergence of this time derivative of your vector potential. Okay. So uh, we leave that first and then uh, we'll come back to this uh, uh, in a minute. Okay. So we look at the, the other uh, source equation involving the curl of your magnetic field and your time derivative of your electric field together to form this uh, current density. Okay. If you remember, the thing I want you to uh, have a feeling just now when I mentioned about the physical idea, remember the idea of when you cut uh, sort of uh, cut across the, the field lines of a magnetic field, it actually can cause current. And of course, you, you if you uh, sort of have a varying uh, electric field, that also gives you a current. So that's the, the, the normal physical ideas that one should you know, already have uh, within you, okay? So when you do all these other things, you, you have that at the back of your mind. So let, let's now uh, introduce the gauge potentials inside this uh, magnetic field and electric field. So your case of your magnetic field will be given by the uh, curl of your uh, vector potential. And your uh, electric field here will be given in terms of your gradient or scalar plus uh, this uh, time derivative of your vector potential. So here you already have a time derivative, so that will, over here then will be a second order time derivative. Okay. So uh, now this looks more complicated, uh, but here is where your gauge, uh, the idea of gauge transformation can come into play to make things look simpler. Okay. So let's uh, us recall also the other thing that the other thing that one has over here is a a curl of a curl. So there's a, a if you remember there's a vector identity for this uh, a cross b cross c. For example, you can apply that identity in in a way, but uh, given that this is now an operator one has to make sure that you have the ordering uh, done properly but you have that vector identity uh, I think I can remember it's like their back cap uh, rule but uh, now uh, using your gradient operator so the only thing that one has to be careful that one cannot simply swap your gradient to other position easily okay so if you just check back your vector calculus and then you have you will find a vector identity this will be reduced to a Laplacian 
of your uh, wet potential and then the other uh, part of that uh, term will be this uh, gradient of the divergence of your vector potential. Okay. Now let's uh, look at those terms individually and, and try to see where we can actually simplify things. Well, one of the things that we can actually see over here, here you have your gradient here, here you have your gradient here. Now, uh, I can sort of put them together, okay, so that this becomes like the gradient of the divergence of A plus 1 over C d phi dt. Okay, these two terms, okay, these two terms over here will correspond to so one way we could actually simplify this equation is to make this thing to be equal to zero. Now, can you actually do that? Yes, you can because you have this, uh, remember we have this flexibility of introducing uh, your function psi here so that uh, you, you make this simultaneous change of this together with that, that will uh, just give you the same uh, electric field and magnetic field. So one can actually do that. And this condition, so that this will be equal to zero, okay, this condition is called the Lorentz gauge condition. So how can you actually do this? Well, let's just introduce uh, uh, your A dash and phi dash, the, the transform uh, potentials over here. And then you just plug in the, the form of the uh, gauge transformation over here for A dash, and then your gauge transformation here for your phi dash. And then you get this to be uh, del dot A plus one over C d phi dt coming from here. And then you have del dot del psi, which is a del squared. And then you have uh, the dt of this time derivative, which give you a second order uh, time derivative of psi. Okay. So all what we need to do is to introduce a psi such that. Uh, such that uh, when you add with this uh, condition, okay, that will give you a zero. That will give you the, the Lorentz gauge condition that we need. So you introduce in such a way that your psi must obey this condition. Okay, remember that your psi is an arbitrary function. So now we will restrict it a little bit further that, uh, that this Lorentz gauge is a uh, is a gauge uh, transformation for which uh, your psi becomes a little bit more specific so that it gives you this term which cancels out the, the extra things. Okay, So in other words, all one needs is to make sure that your psi obeys that. And that will give you the necessary gauge condition that satisfies this. Okay, so in other words, with the help of this extra arbitrary function, psi, make it, uh, make this psi to obey that, okay, this condition here, then that will give you, will give rise to this Lorentz gauge condition. So this extra uh, what you call ambiguity in terms of what functions uh, that you can put inside a, a gauge potential helps you to, to create a situation where you can simplify equations. Okay, 
So that was the thing, that was the advantage I mentioned earlier. Okay, it looks like a complication, it looks like an ambiguity that you introduce when you introduce a potential, but that ambiguity actually helps you. Okay, so uh, even then, when you, you sort of make your site to be a little bit more specific to obey this so that you can implement the Lorentz gauge, you still have this side, you know, uh, it's still, uh, what you call, there's still freedom in choosing what this side is supposed to be. Okay, remember that this side initially is an arbitrary function and then you make it more, we call the Lorentz gauge. Even after Im implementing this Lorentz gauge, you still can add further side, meaning I can now replace, for example, psi to psi dash, where uh, your psi dash is now given by your old psi plus another, maybe I should write this with a different function, say maybe xi, for example, okay, where your xi. So uh, where your xi over here uh, will have to obey this uh, this equation. So in other words, uh, if I do this, I should be having this equation. Okay. So there is still an arbitrariness inside your psi that implements your Lorentz gauge. There's still an arbitrariness provided your xi over here actually obeys this equation. And this equation is something that you have seen before. This is just what we call the wave equation. Okay. So uh, even under the, the Lorentz gauge condition, uh, you still have uh, arbitrariness uh, in terms of your 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 the, your gauge transformation okay you can actually add you no know, you still have uh, a choice how to to you know you still have a choice of the functions that being involved okay so it's not uh, fixed uh, it's still arbitrary okay so let's uh Let's say you have all those, okay? Let's say you have all those. Now, what do we have uh, with our source equation? So, this is the one we had earlier for the, the divergence of your uh, electric field. So, we had that. And then we have from this one, the other source equations, we now have that, okay? That, that is coming from the other, uh, Remember that that was supposed to be del, del cross del cross a, so it broken it broke up, so it's broken up into two, two terms, where you have your Laplacian here, and then you have that, and then you impose your Lorentz condition over here. So what's left? If you impose the Lorentz condition, then the only thing that you have left is this term, and this term. Okay, on the on the left hand side but if you look at what this is your del squared is just d d x square y square d d z square so this is your del squared okay and you can see that, okay, this is just coming from your uh, spatial derivatives, okay? But then you can see that, okay, the other derivative that we have here is your time derivative. And this time derivative is essentially of the different uh, sign. So here is negative here. So this will be a plus. And uh, you know that, okay, your x, y, z, x, y, z is your spatial condition for your uh, position vector in special relativity. The other fourth condition, a uh, fourth component 
essentially is your thunder uh, sorry your 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 time okay your time coordinate sorry your time coordinate uh multiplied by the uh, uh speed of light c that is just to make uh this has the same dimension of as the the x y z okay and what you have over here is essentially one over c squared see one over c squared oh so now i can actually write down one over c squared d2 d t squared as simply d2 uh, c t squared okay so in other words it's just the uh, second order derivative with respect to the forward so one can introduce an analog of this uh, Laplacian operator to the case of the four dimension, including time. Okay, and this is given by this symbol, this uh, box symbol. Okay, this box symbol is called uh, Dalembertian operator. Okay which is essentially that uh, operator. Okay, so given you uh, impose your Lorentz gauge condition, so this term is not there, you're left with uh, this uh, equation over here. The Dalembertian operator acting on your vector potential gives you the current density operator. So now we can return back to this part of the equation okay we return to this equation uh, over here what we need is essentially to replace your your the ADT here remember the the ADT uh, how should I write it? maybe okay I have hmm, let me let me write the gauge condition first. Del dot a uh, what was it plus one over c d phi d t. Okay, that is supposed to be equal to zero. Now, if I simply take the time derivative of this, I have d t d t del dot a uh, plus one will see d to phi d t squared equals zero. Now I can swap this. I can swap this. This becomes del dot d a d t. Okay, and that is precisely this term. This term inside the, the other uh, source equation. So I can replace that by this term. So I put uh, del dot d a d t equals to minus 1 over, uh, 1 over c d to phi d t squared. Okay. So remember I have a, this 1 over c multiplied by the other one was c that gives you this uh these two terms okay your your laplacian plus the second order derivative of, of respect to time times this factor one was c squared onto the same scalar potential okay so with that okay i can uh, replace and the, the the equation for the uh, source equation for electric field okay given by the okay it's the dilemmation operator acting on your scalar potential to give your charge density and similarly for the other source equation is your dilemmation operator acting on your vector potential to give your current density so that's 
convenient and that tells us something is no, something is uh, something deeper is, uh, is is going on underlying all this uh, gauge transformation thing okay so uh, what happens in the case of the vacuum uh, one can actually do this easily uh, the case of vacuum is when you have your charge density is zero and your current density is zero. Okay, so in that particular case, you have your dilemmation operator at your know, A equals zero, dilemmation operator at you know, your scalar potential equals zero. But what is dilemmation operator anyway? That's the wave equation. That's the wave. You no, know, essentially you get a wave equation for A and wave equation for phi. Okay. And similarly, uh, if one uh, checks this out, you can also show that this uh, gives you the same uh, dilemmation operator acting on E equals zero, dilemmation operator acting on P equals zero, provided this is, no, this is true. So this is a wave operator. No, uh, I call this as a wave operator now. Okay easily from you know, rather than seeing all this dilemmation thing. So this is a wave operating on E equals zero uh, and wave operator acting on B equals zero and essentially the, the solution to this wave operator is just your you know, solution for your electromagnetic waves. So you can write this as a plane wave you know, uh, uh, one moving forward in time and oh, sorry one so yeah one propagating uh, forward and the other one is propagating uh, uh, in the negative direction okay so uh, that sort of okay that connects back what we know about uh, electromagnetic waves in vacuum so you have these two possible direction of propagation okay right so so far okay let me just stress at this point so far uh, we have not really implemented any idea of a special relativity here okay uh, the only thing sort of hints uh, there is a kind of uh, relativistic notion here is the introdu introduction of this uh, dilemmation operator okay the, the derivative that we we have over here seem to connect with this uh, derivative over here okay but we still have the fact that okay i have i have your your vector potential separate from your scalar potential okay but somehow somehow okay Somehow we have these two equations indicating something uh, deeper. You have this equation. This equation is coming from Maxwell equation, but you know, the fact that you can actually write both potentials being operated by this wave operator, so, uh, so to speak, to get your sources, it indicates something uh, deeper uh, in a way. So that's so that's the thing that we want to do next to show that there is uh, uh, some relativistic notion related to this uh, uh, potential uh, the wave sorry the uh, vector potential and the scalar potential. So let me from a little bit now maybe uh, uh, ask a question and then we'll take. A little bit uh, of say three minutes break. Any question at this stage? Still there? Okay, so we'll take uh, say around three minutes break. Okay. Okay, everyone's back. Right, okay, let's continue. Uh, 
Doctor, do you mind circling the equations that you are referring to because your cursor doesn't show up in your presentation? So it's hard to know which equations you're referring to. Okay. Uh, yeah, I noticed this uh, when I look at the video. So I'll do that. Okay. Just. Thank you so much, Doctor. Right. Okay. Right. So now. Uh, we'll try to uh, formulate things a little bit more relativistically now. So we go to this particular section. So one of the things that probably complicates a bit is the, the, the fact that you have your sources. So you need to somehow address rho and G, how can one make this, uh, you know, these notions in a much more intrinsic way uh, with respect to relativity? In some way, you can already see that okay, you no, know, if I think of this as a, a spatial components and this as your your fourth component, that should make things uh, work a little bit. But before we actually do that, you no. Know, that uh, another thing that one one needs to know there is this relationship physically. Uh, if you think of your charge density, you take your charge density to flow. That should be your current density. Okay, so you have that notion somehow related with respect to how uh, rho changes and then. Uh, with respect to motion, and that will give rise to your current current density. So one needs to introduce all these kind of things uh, uh, in a, a fashion that that sort of respects uh, uh, special relativity kind of ideas. So one of the things that one needs to see, for example, when we talk about charges. You normally think of your charges contained inside inside your uh, a particular volume element, like the one we have seen earlier. We, we sort of integrate your charge density of a, a volume element to give you a charge. Okay. The only problem that one can see over here is your volume can change under change of uh, what you call reference frames. Okay. If it's just a matter of translating or rotation, then there's no problem. But you can also have boost. Okay, so when you have boost, for example, uh, uh, you boosting inside your, no, you you boosting your reference frame along your x direction, for example, then your length, uh, the appear the appearance to another observer. Uh, of your boosted reference frame is that your length contracts. So there will be a length contraction factor here that sort of say, okay, uh, then something must happen also to the case of your charge density. Okay, so let's see, let's consider the length contraction for your volume element. Okay, so for your volume element, so you think of the x, the y, the z, for example. Sorry, I've forgotten that I should now uh, circle the thing. Uh, uh, all right, uh, so your this is your volume element. So your volume element, uh, let's say you have a boost along your x direction. Okay, so your length x will be contracted, but your transverse, uh, what you call components or the transverse direction will not be contracted. So the only uh, uh, changes that you see is because of this, uh, uh, what you call, the boost along the x direction. So what happens in this particular case is that you get your uh, dv uh, changes only by this factor of uh, square 1 minus v squared on c squared, which is the same factor for your uh, Lorentz contraction, multiplied with the original 
volume element. Okay, so this is the original volume element. This is for Lorenz Booth. Okay. So uh, one must make sure that okay. Uh, remember, uh, in relate in special relativity, your physical ideas, your physical notion, uh, for example, your charges, is something that you can actually measure. And that one should not change under uh, uh, change of inertial frames, okay? particularly in the case of when you have a Lorentz boost. Okay? Your Lorentz boost just change from a, a, a stationary uh, inertial frame to a moving uh, inertial frame. So in other words, that uh, changes should not change the physical physical content of your no uh, system being considered uh, in part in it, in this particular case is your uh, the the physical content is just, uh, your amount of charge. So somehow uh, the factor that you introduce inside your volume element will be uh, sort of uh, what you call because this is physical, so that should not change. So whatever you introduce inside your DV, uh, inside your DV will be compensated by this change in your rho. So your DV changes by that. Okay, so one over gamma here. So uh, then your charge density should be uh, changing as well with respect to uh, the Lorentz boost by the factor that compensates this change in in in, uh, in the volume element. So the one that compensates that is essentially your gamma factor. So when you multiply gamma with one over gamma, then you will just you know, compensate the, uh, the whole thing. So, uh, now what we, we are saying that okay if you have rho naught as your your original charge density okay, rho naught your original or in this case you can talk about the proper uh, proper charge density okay, because when it's moving you can always take uh, the the instantaneous frame that correspond to the original uh, uh, charge density. Okay. So if rho naught is your what we call the proper charge density, then uh, rho will be the one uh, uh, that sort of changes under Lorentz boost. Okay. I hope that's a bit clear. Uh, so the idea is just to compensate this uh, the change in your dv by the change in your rho. Okay. So that tells us, okay, now I know that your rho is going to be, uh, your rho here will be, uh, uh, what you call, under Lorentz boost, will acquire this gamma factor over here. So uh, that tells us, okay, then it makes sense for us to relate uh, uh, also your current density. But now your current density essentially involves your uh, the, the motion of the charges. But you already know uh, V mu, if you remember your four velocity, okay, your four velocity is already having the gamma v here, and then the the, the the fourth component is actually c. Okay. So uh, what we are saying over here is that if we introduce 
what we call a current flow vector in such a way that this is given by your proper charge density times the flow velocity then you should be able to reproduce what uh, no, the, the situation that we need to combine your charge density with your current density. So let's see how this plays out. So when you put your V mu to be gamma Vc, so you have that, okay, and then uh, your rho naught times gamma is essentially rho naught times gamma is that that's rho v and then your rho naught times gamma times c is rho c okay so that sort of okay now what we have actually done rho v is just your current density Rho C is like the fourth component. Okay, so, uh, but that's good because why Rho C? C is just a constant. Okay, C is just a constant and the one that's, that matters over here is your Rho, your charge density. So now you make a connection between your charge density with, with your current density in a relativistic uh, notion of your current forward okay but uh, remember that we, that we have to check other things as well for example your equation of continuity here that tells you about uh, charge conservation okay what would that correspond to well if you look at this for example you have uh, the time derivative of your charge, charge density and then over here is the divergence which is uh, your spatial derivative so your spatial derivative connects with your time derivative to give you the uh, equation of continuity So in other words, this is just like together will be like your space and time derivative. So in other words, what one has is you can combine this together uh, to form this uh, d dx mu. Okay. And that will uh, uh, sort of give you this uh, uh, equation which is j mu comma mu which is actually this okay maybe i should write this first this is just a shorthand notation remember the comma mu correspond to the derivative so this is that okay this thing it's the same thing as that so in other words, now we have everything uh, what we need uh, in terms of relating your source, in this case your current density and your charge density into a more relativistic uh, notion. So now one goes back to the, 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 the equation that we had earlier uh, with respect to your gauge potential. So in, given that you have uh, written your source, your, your current density and your charge density into a single uh, entity, uh, which is your, uh, what do I call this? Uh, current four vectors, okay? So this current four vector is now uh, having both your current density and your charge density together. Okay? And you can see that it appears here inside this one and this one so in other words these two should also be related this a and phi should be related 
and uh, the way to do this is to make them a four vector. So a four vector uh, for your gauge potential, gauge potential, four vector is given by your vector potential here as your the first three components, and then your fourth component is given by your scalar potential. And this gauge potential is written as a contravariant vector with the index on top. If you want to convert this to the case of your covariant vector, then uh, the only difference from the contravariant case is your uh, sign over here. Okay. So now what do we have? We have now this, uh, remember that this sort of these two equations replace Maxwell equation. Maxwell source equation. Okay. So now we we can rewrite this Maxwell source equation into uh, an equation which uh, looks like a four vector four vector equation, which is great. Okay. When you put things in terms of electric field and magnetic field, you don't actually see these things happening. Okay. You don't see that these are actually part of a, a, a much more uh, coherent thing or bigger thing. So now you can actually see the things actually works with uh, the current flow vector coming in together with the potential. So that's great. Okay. So uh, right. What's this? Okay. Uh, so what is uh, okay? This is just a notation kind of. Uh, Explanation over here. Your dilemmation operator is really, uh, is really this. Okay, s mu, s mu, which I can write this as eta mu nu d dx mu d dx mu. Okay. Oops. So it's just a, a shorthand notation. Uh, uh, okay, the, the common notation tends to be a bit confusing over here. So one can actually rewrite this as comma mu mu, meaning uh, anything after the comma is actually a derivative. Okay, so this is just that. Okay. So I can write now this equation in a different form in this way. So, okay, now let's make another connection. Let's make another connection. The one that we have seen earlier, we talked about field strength tensor. The field strength tensor has this, uh, what do you call, field strength tensor. So recall, just write this thing down. Field strength tensor is the one that we have introduced earlier uh, as an example of a tensor. Okay? And uh, we define in such a way that this F mu nu is related to this magnetic fields here and also the electric fields on, on this in this matrix. Matrix form evolving. Uh, E and B. Now, you might start to wonder, now, if I, uh, by, by the virtue of this uh, Maxwell equation written in terms of the potential, you might wonder what is really this F mu nu in terms of the potential. Okay? 
So uh, here is where the thing gets more interesting. Just look at the case of your uh, magnetic field. So here is the magnetic field in terms of the potential. Okay. If I write down the, the components here, so here are the components. Okay. And I write it in terms of the derivatives uh, uh, with respect to the spatial, uh, call spatial coordinates. Okay. Because these are just uh, derivative with respect to spatial coordinates. I can write down. Uh, Recall that we can write down your x equals to uh, the, sort of the first component, y equals the second component, z equals the third component. So I can rewrite your uh, bx, by, and bz as b1. Uh, so this is really bx over here, by, bz. Instead of writing in terms of x, y, z, I write in terms of b1, b2, b3. And uh, look at uh, how this is de being defined in terms of the potential. So your b1 over here is given by a3, 2. This is uh, d dx2, a3 minus d dx3, a2. Okay, and similarly for the rest. Okay, you just recall how how you define your your curve, okay, in terms of a determinant. Okay. Y, J, K, D, D, X, and then your your components of your A. Okay, so you can get this, and you can actually see some some. Uh, pattern okay here you have index one here and the one uh, and the the index that appears on the other side is uh, those components which is besides one so here you talk about three comma two here is three comma two here and then two comma three and then for b2 so you have 1 comma 3, 3 comma 1, and B3, 2 comma 1, 1 comma 2. So you have some kind of pattern that you actually can see. And what about E? Okay, your E can be uh, uh, written in terms of your potential in this way. Okay, and uh, one can write this in terms of your potential A mu. in terms of a mu here so it can be written as as follows and again you can see there's a, again another set of patterns here is e1 here is 4 comma 1 1 comma 4 e2 4 comma 2 2 comma 4 e3 4 comma 3 3 comma 4 so there is this underlying pattern that comes into play when you have uh, expressed uh, your magnetic field and electric field in terms of potential. Let's plug this thing in into your field strengthens. Okay, so it looks like this. Okay, so this is coming from the uh, magnetic field. So this is uh, your B and this is from your E. Sorry about that. It doesn't look pretty. But now you can see, okay, something is going on here. Okay. Uh, this is the uh, first row. So you get 2, 1, 1, 2, 3, 1, 1, 3, 4, 1, 1, 4. Okay. First row. Second row. 1 comma 2, 2 comma 1. Uh, if I want to, uh, let, let, let me do this. Uh, here I can write as a1 comma 1 minus a1 comma 1. But that's 0. OK. 
Okay, same thing here. Here's a two comma two minus a two comma two. That's zero. And then a three comma two minus a two comma three. A four comma two minus a two comma four. So generally, your f mu nu is now given in terms of uh, your potential as uh, f mu nu equals to uh, a nu comma mu minus a mu comma, comma nu. Uh, much more friendly, I think, is in this particular form, uh, partial mu, which is partial mu means d dx mu, Partial mu a nu minus partial nu a mu. And one of the things that becomes automatic in this particular form is that when you exchange mu and nu, you get a minus sign. So in other words, uh, this thing gets simpler when you express a uh, your electric field and magnetic field in terms of your potential. And and that goes even further, that saying that, okay, uh, what it is, all your your uh, electric and magnetic field uh, are, are part of a much bigger thing uh, uh, when written in terms of the, this, this uh, gauge potential. Okay? And for this matter, this, uh, the one that we call the Fieldstein tensor, is sometimes called a Maxwell 4 tensor. Okay. Uh, right. What else? I think, um, how much more do we have here? Let me just check. Okay, what's the other thing that one can actually get from this field strength tensor when written in terms of this uh, uh, gauge potential uh, in a, in a four-dimensional form? Okay, one of the things that we get is there's an identity which is sort of uh, uh, becomes true automatically. Due to the 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 anti nature of that, in fact, I think I, I believe we have also done this uh, earlier. So what happens is that okay, you have this identity when you take f mu nu comma rho, f mu comma rho here, and then you do a cyclic permutation. So nu goes first, rho comes second, uh, mu goes first, so nu goes first, rho comes second, and mu comes third. And then you do the same thing, cycle them again, rho comes first, uh, mu comes second, and nu comes third. Now you add all these terms together, essentially uh, uh, when you write it in terms of this, sorry, when you write this in terms of uh, this form, okay, uh, or this form, either one, okay, then uh, you get all the terms to be cancelled automatically. And that gives you a zero. This is sometimes called, I'm not sure whether I've introduced this earlier, but this is sometimes called the Bianchi identity for the electromagnetic field tensor. Now, is there something special about this identity? Well, it is, okay? Now, if you look at the components of this Bianchi identity, what actually happens? So let's take uh, the case of mu equals to one, nu equals to one, okay? So I would have F, F11 here, one here, one here, one, uh, one here, sorry, uh, one here, one here, one here, one. 
Okay, so that gives you f11 comma row, f1 row comma one, f row one comma one, and that must be equal to zero. F11, F11 is automatically zero. Okay, F11 is just zero. What about here? F1 row, comma one, F1 row, comma one, F row one, comma one. But F1 row is equals to minus F row one. Okay, so what happens? This cancels out with that. Okay, this cancels out with that. So one can always check now. If you take the case of uh, the other case would be mu cos to nu cos to two, mu cos to nu cos to three. Okay. We leave out the fourth component at the moment. Okay. So uh, they always give you the what we call a trivial identity. So the one that is more interesting is to consider the case. When they are different, so when they are different, so example mu equals to one, nu equals to two, rho equals to three. Okay, so let's put that into the Bianchi identity, one above. Okay, so just replace uh, your mu, nu, and rho here. So that gives you this f12 comma 3 f plus f23 comma 1 plus f31 comma 2 and you look at what this is what this is what this is that's essentially your third component of your magnetic field comma 3 first component of your magnetic field comma 1 second component of your magnetic field comma 2 so that gives you uh, that gives you essentially the the source free equation for your magnetic field. Okay, that's great. Uh, now we start to consider. Okay, I can also consider the case where mu and nu is one and two, but Rho is 4 and see what happens. Okay. So you, again, you just simply plug in the, the, the indices in this way 1, 2, 4, 2, 4, 1, 1, 2, and then write down in terms of your uh, electric and magnetic field. That gives you that. Okay, it's not easily identifiable at this stage. So we continue. With uh, this particular case, again, you get this, and you continue with this, and you get that. Now, this three equation, actually can be combined into this. So in other words, this is your the other source free equation. So remember there are two source free equations. So your Bianchi identity, which is automatic, okay, from the form of your uh, f mu nu, okay, Bianchi identity automatically satisfied by your uh, field strength tensor corresponds to the source free equation. And that's great. So we have a, a compact way of writing your, your source free equation in terms to a single identity which we know that it automatically satisfied. So now uh, what's left is to consider the source equations. 
for the source equation, one needs to consider uh, uh, this quantity, which is uh, uh, it's like the divergence of your uh, your field strength tensor. Okay. So uh, let's rewrite this in terms of your 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 potentials here, and then we look at this individual terms of that. Okay. So you can see over here there are contraction between the first index here and the, the, the index at the bottom and also the index here and the index here. So we have to look at each of these. The one which is this one, we have this A new contracted with the, the derivative here. This gives you this equation. You just need to check this. Okay. And then uh, the other equation over here, okay, the other term, sorry, the other term over here gives you this equation. Now, if you look what those are, these are essentially your Lorentz condition. And this one essentially is your, the Lambertian operator acting on your, 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 potential forward time. So in other words, if we impose the Lorentz condition, okay, the one that's left is essentially this dimension operator. So then you can actually write this as that. But we already know that your dimension operator acting on your gauge, uh, on your gauge uh, potential forward time, is uh, related to your current density forward, your current forward. Also. So let's look at that. So in other words, we are now checking f mu nu comma nu equals to five pi four pi sorry four pi over c j mu. What is the physical content of this? Again, we do this. Uh, component by component. Let's take mu equals to 4. Remember, the, the only free index over here is this one. So this is dummy index. Okay. So mu equals 4 gives you f1, comma 1, f1, so f4, 2, sorry, f4, 2, comma 2, f3, f4, 3, comma 3. And that must be equal to j4. j4, remember, is rho c. Okay, so rho c, the c here, cancels out with the c at the denominator, and you essentially get your five, 4 pi rho, that's convenient. Okay, and now all the thing that we need to check is what this are. Here, uh, what we are doing, we are using the, uh, let me write this down, essentially, I'm writing f mu nu uh, to change to f mu nu at the bottom. Okay, that says what we are trying to do. So what I can try to do is uh, I need a little bit more space here. So this goes to the following f mu nu. So how do you get that? I will have to, well, how, it's just trying to relate your, your contravariant tensor to your uh, covariant tensor. So what you do, essentially, you contract it with your Minkowski metric. Okay, so that is essentially the, uh, the relation that we need. So since we define things in terms of the covariant case, remember we did this thing earlier in terms of the covariant, okay? Go to the one, yeah. Over here we define in terms of the covariant tensor. So uh, what we did here, uh, sorry, where is it? What we did here, we have to raise it up so that it can contract the, uh, the, the 
with respect to the derivative okay contraction is here and here so we need this to be in the upper index but what is uh, what is f mu nu so we need to relate to this f mu nu uh, f mu nu with the, the lower index so it's just a matter of that we are given in terms of the upper index here so we need to relate back to the one with the lower index okay and once we do that uh, I think in this particular case the only thing that happens over here it requires a minus sign okay uh, because of the uh, f4 here so this so, so you put eta 4 alpha okay, eta 4 alpha uh, and eta say 1 beta okay for the the this term goes to that okay and uh, this can only work for the case of eta for 4 and eta 1 1 eta for 4 is minus 1 and eta 1 1 is plus 1 okay so that gives you the minus sign here similarly for here and here but what are these you can check back to the matrix that one that we defined above this is just e1 comma 1 plus e1 uh, e2 comma 2 plus e3 comma 3 which is essentially your source equation for your net treatment. So that is taking mu equals to 4. Now one can start to check for mu equals to 1. Again, just you know, substitute the indices. So you just get essentially the following. And on the right hand side is J1. J1 is no, uh, essentially uh, the first component of your current density and what corresponds on to the left hand side here is essentially this equation okay which uh, we recognize this for example this two part is coming from the curve and this one is a time derivative So you can check for the rest of this. Uh, uh, I leave this an exercise for you to do. Okay, check for the mu equals two. Check for mu equals to three, and then combine all these three equations that you have to form the other source equation. So this equation that you had earlier, this one equals to that okay. sorry about that uh, since the cursor is not working uh, which is this one gives you the source equation okay so more or less we have described all the Maxwell equation in terms of uh, one is the Bianchi identity Okay. And as for the source equation, we have to involve the current density, the current forward. So, and that will actually uh, describe all of the Maxwell equations that we already know. And it is done in the form which is friendlier to uh, special relativity because you have a, a tensor. Okay. Remember that the idea of 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 special relativity. Uh, they must be uh, the objects that we are describing physically must be must behave in a well-defined manner under uh, trans transformation of coordinates. So they must transform as a tensor. And, and this is it. Okay. Another possibility which I would not uh, well too much. Maybe I'll do this as an assignment question later is to rewrite things in terms of the dual tensor okay 
What happens, uh, I think we have done this earlier as an example, the dual tensor just switch between uh, your electric field to magnetic field, and then this one is, I think I've forgotten here, is minus E. Okay. And then again, once you just switch those, you know, some, of, some of your uh, equation gets swapped. Okay. So here, you, again, you get uh, your source, uh, source-free equation and so on and so forth. So I will not do this, I will probably leave that as an exercise. Now, uh, okay. That's the end of this lecture, 13. So the, the thing that you have to, uh, to understand now, essentially, uh, uh, in special relativities, uh, your Maxwell equation sort of, you know, essentially, you know, you have separate equations for electric field and magnetic field. Now can be written in a much more uh, uh, economical way where you, everything is done in terms of field strength tensor. And even the field strength tensor can be written in terms of your potentials. And you know that the poten uh, when you write in terms of potential, the thing gets a, a little bit more uh, transparent in terms of the formulas. So we had this earlier, okay. and this looks uh, no, what you call what's the word for it? I mean, it's I mean it's a, a nice form, elegant. Okay, so, and that's the thing I want to say, elegant. So I think I probably want to stop here for, because I do not want to continue on the next topic, which is essentially, uh, let me see what this is. Uh, yeah, the transformation for your uh, gauge potentials. Okay. So there are two types of transformation that we're going to look at, the gauge transformation and also your Lorentz transformation. So I think I would like to uh, defer this into the next lecture so that you know, give, you to, uh, give you time to digest what we have done so far. So let me go to take the attendance. Things have changed a little bit here. Okay, okay uh, are there any questions at this stage that you want to ask immediately? There's something on the chat box which I didn't see before. And any questions before we leave? No? Otherwise, uh, we'll continue next week. Uh, so that's probably uh, on Wednesday. So on Thursday, we will have our second test. Okay? Yeah, the, 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 the topics that was involved in assignment two. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay, bye.